This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast for everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level. You came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and believes arguing with people online will change their mind. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki. Sinosplice.com and is a local celebrity. Do you wish you could learn Chinese the way a child does? After listening to this episode, you may change your mind. John and I discuss the differences of how children and adults learn a language and highlight areas where they are somewhat similar. We also have a listener question, and you'll get a rant and a rave. Our guest interview is with Matt McGill, an actor on the popular YouTube channel Mama Hu Hu. Who learn Chinese on the streets of Shanghai? All this and more. Let's get to it. Hey, John, how you doing today? Hey, Jared, pretty good. It's morning here in Shanghai. All right, it's evening here in the states. Well, since last episode, we asked for some ratings and reviews, and we did get quite a few. We really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, guys. That really helps us to、uh, figure out directions for new podcasts, and、uh, it just gives us feedback so we can adjust what we're doing. And obviously, it helps a little bit to know that all this, you know, blabbing we're doing is is helpful to people. And I'm going to give a a shout out to Blanca Sabotova. She's、uh, from the Czech Republic. She said,、uh, "Great episode. Thanks for all the tips. I totally fell in love with the Crazy Rich Asian soundtrack. All the best from the Czech Republic." Yeah, I, I me too. I fell in love with that Crazy Rich Asian soundtrack, and I'm glad that you enjoyed that, Blanca. And I'm sure a lot of other people did. I hope if you. Got something out of that? I hope you were able to pick up some Chinese from listening to the music. And I still haven't listened to it, but I will. I keep hearing how bad that movie is, but、um, I like music. It wasn't a bad movie. Did you? You didn't see it? No. I, I liked it. it. Just didn't sound interesting to me. I thought it was great. I mean, that's cool that an all Asian movie was big in Hollywood,、um, but the plot didn't sound interesting to me. I, I thought it was pretty funny. I, there was a lot of great comic relief and. And the end part was a little bit reminiscent of like、um, the wedding singer, where you know he. It was great. You just got to see the movie. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. All right. Also, the music that we shared in the last episode was like you know that Chodo Fu. That some people said, hey, that's、yeah, kids' music. Well, I mean, yeah, some of it's kids. It's for kids. But I think as adults too, we can get a lot out of that, even if it is a kids song. And it certainly does get stuck in your head. Well, I think that when we talk about kids' music, that also brings up a topic that、uh, I wanted to talk about today. And sometimes we have people ask, they're like, "Hey, you know, can I just learn Chinese like a kid does? Can I just kind of pick it up and and naturally absorb the language by just being around it all the time?" Yeah, and I would say the answer is that in theory you can, but in practice it's very difficult, if not impossible. I, I don't know, Jared. I would guess that you actually tried this when you were living in China. Is that right? Yeah, I would. I would say I kind of did. You know, when I had first moved to China, I had started studying Chinese a little bit. I wasn't really serious about it, but you know, I just kind of had this impression that if I was just around it all the time, and you know, and I worked in a Chinese company、um, when I first came to China, and you know, so Chinese was just around me all the time. We had an IE at home. But you know, I just found that my Chinese really didn't take off. I just picked up a lot of words and little phrases, but I, I was really stunted. I, I really wasn't able to speak. Okay, and what we're talking about now is、uh, speaking, right? So we're talking about pre-literacy. You know, kids learn to to speak、uh, well before they can read and write, and、uh, they seem to do it without much effort. So why can't adults do it? And、uh, the answer is they can, but it involves a lot of things that adults are typically not willing to do. So, for example, you ask your teacher, your Chinese friend, how to say something. They tell you. You try to say it. Fine. Five minutes later, you forget. You ask them again. All right. How many times are you willing to do that? Or more like you know, two seconds later. I mean, I, I, sometimes I feel like I instantly forget things. Okay. So you ask them, and then. Five seconds later, you're asking them again. Two seconds, John. Two seconds. All right, two seconds. Two seconds. Two seconds. The point is, how many times are you willing to do that before you you give up and just get frustrated and you know go in your your bathroom and cry? Because a kid will just keep doing it over and over. They don't care. So that's just a simple example of what a child is totally willing to do, not embarrassed, which、uh, adults will really struggle to do. 
So, John, what you're getting at here is the way that kids actually acquire the language. Yeah. How do they how do they get focused input? Like if they need a certain word and they don't know it, then they're going to ask. And if they forget, they're going to ask again. And if they use it wrong, then adults will usually correct kids more quickly than they'll correct adults. And so what happens is they get the input they need when they need it. And if they don't, they make sure they ask for it and they're never embarrassed about it. You know, that's so true. I think about a lot of times when I was just learning Chinese, you know, I wanted to ask and someone said, oh, you know, how do you say this? And, and tell me, you know, then, of course, two seconds later, I forget. I mean, you're going to be embarrassed at some point learning a language. But, you know, I always felt bad at continually asking. And you're right. It's like there's there's limits, right? There's limits on which you're willing to put someone through the rigmarole of, of getting them to remind you and repeat what it is you're supposed to learn. And, and there's points either where they're going to get frustrated, or you're going to get frustrated. And it's not totally your fault because most people will have a lot more patience with a child asking how to say something 10 times in a row than with an adult. And I think something else is to point out is that it is totally normal to instantly forget something. Like someone tells you in two seconds or from John, five seconds, forget what it is that they told you. Right, right. So this is one thing, like asking about stuff and forgetting and asking again. But another aspect is just other psychological hangups that adults have. So, for example, you're learning Chinese. You're in like your, I don't know, your fifth week and your textbook teaches you the ba structure. Right? In my opinion, that's way too early. But anyway, your textbook teaches it. So as an adult who's very serious about studying, you might be like, well, the textbook teaches it. So I have to learn it. And you just have this big hang up and you and it's really hard for you because really it's a you know, a bit higher than your level, but you just keep trying and trying. But see, that's not what a kid would do. A kid would be like, what? That's boring. I'm not going to talk about that. And, and they'll just immediately discard it. Kids do that, but adults don't. Another example that falls along the same lines is, you know, adults will, many of them will meticulously record every single word that comes up in their lesson. And then they'll try to make sure they never forget any of it, right? Kids do not do that. They're like, what do I need? All right, I'll use that. Oh, you taught me that yesterday? Oh, I forgot. Ha ha, I don't care. Adults don't do that. So I think what you're getting at here is that kids are really focusing on learning things that are functional and useful to them right now. Kids are ruthless pragmatists. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> and they don't have a conscience when it comes to language acquisition, whereas adults very much do. They apply their work ethic. Yeah. So it's like, I, I learned a new word. I'm going to make sure I incorporate it in my conversation today. Yeah, and kids do that too sometimes. Um, but when they do it, it's because they want to and because it's fun. Not because they're like, oh, I better use this or I'm going to forget it, like motivated, motivated by fear or something. So what you're talking about here, this isn't like something like it's OK for learners, adult learners to do this, like to learn a word and try to use it. But the point is, is that that's not how a child learns. Right. And when people say I, I want to learn like a child, they often don't really realize entirely what they're saying. Another way to put it is think of the way that adults learn languages. Typically, they start with a, with a language class and a textbook. Can you imagine giving a child a textbook of all the things they need to learn how to say? <laughs> it's like, oh, you need to learn how to say eat and you learn, need to learn how to say pee pee. Like a textbook for a kid is just ridiculous. You can't standardize that. Yeah, they just pick it up organically, right? Right. So, but with adults, we don't do that at all. Right. So the expectations are totally different. And the thing is, adults are a lot better at some things. They bring advantages to the language learning table, but they're also a lot worse at, at some things. And it's for the most part psychological. Well, what are some of those differences? Uh, you mean like what are adults good at? Yeah. OK, so understanding grammar. Kids do not understand grammar at all. So they just need tons of examples. And then eventually their brains kind of unconsciously figure out the rule and start applying it. But it takes a long time. Whereas adults, um, especially if they have some understanding of grammar, you know, things like tense or, you know, gender, or all these other grammatical concepts, they'll be able to apply them much more quickly. Uh, maybe not entirely accurately, but, you know, kids make tons of mistakes, too. So typically um, adults, at least in the beginning, they'll make fewer mistakes right after they learn the grammar, whereas kids take a long time to just kind of sort through it. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm my five-year-old right now, he says, them has this, you know, I'm like, well, it's, they have this, you know what I mean? But it's, it's them, you know? And you're right, if we had an adult, they would probably pick that up. I mean, they'd probably still make a mistake like that, but it's easier to make that connection with them. Yeah, and I think adults also forget how often kids make mistakes. Like kids are making mistakes left and right. 
My four-year-old is, his English is pretty good, but he's making mistakes all the time. You know, he doesn't care. My, my seven-year-old, her English is much more fluent. She just makes occasional little mistakes, but we don't really notice these as adults because they're kids. But learning like a kid does not mean never making mistakes. But let's say you took, okay, a kid from the age of maybe three when they're really starting to talk and they're totally in an immersed language environment, whether that be English or Chinese or whatever. But now you take an adult and you put them in that same immersive environment, but also with other study materials and supports, I would venture to think that the adult would actually end up making more progress in that type of environment than a child would. It's possible, but it really depends on the adult's attitude. So if they're totally down with it and they're just like, okay, you guys can't speak any English to me. You don't even speak English and it's going to be frustrating, but I'm going to get through it. Like if they have that kind of attitude, then it'll work. But a lot of adults would be like, how do you expect me to learn this when you won't tell me what it means in English? You know, and that doesn't work. And obviously kids don't do that. Yeah, they'll just struggle through it or just figure it out or just not understand and give you a look and walk away, right? (laughs) Yeah. And one of the things that adults forget about kids, like why are kids so good at learning languages? Why are they so patient? No matter how many times they have to ask, no matter how many times they forget, they just keep going. Well, it's because they don't have a choice. They're getting their first language they, they've they never learned another language, so they don't know how long it should take. They don't have another language that they can ask someone to translate for. Um, they have no choice. And so to them, it's just existence. It's not like, oh, I got to work hard, got to got to acquire this language. You know, they just have to. You know, with our interview we have for this episode with Matt McGill, he talks about his experience actually doing this because he didn't go through any classes or anything like that. He just self-studied and learned Chinese by himself on the street making mistakes over and over again. He talks about, you'll, well, you'll hear it in the interview, but, you know, he'd come out with his, something he wanted to say, like every day, a sentence or whatever, and he'd go out there and say it, and people would try to understand what he's saying, and they're like, oh, you mean this? And uh, they're like, oh, yeah, and he'd just do that over and over and over again until he'd get it and get all these different sentences in his head. Right, and I think that's great. Like, it's not that um, you shouldn't try to learn like a child. There are some things that you should try to do, and if you do it, you will acquire the language more quickly. I think I did a lot of the same thing, just talking to people, not being embarrassed, asking all kinds of questions. Like I would ask questions that I didn't even care the answers to, just to ask more questions and to speak and to hear what they might say. I think one thing that's interesting is that kids often say things that are just like, why are they even saying this? My son will say things to me like, daddy, it's daytime. It's like, yeah, I know it's daytime. Um <laughs> But maybe he never said that before. Right. Hmm. And after he said it, you know, he's got that practice and it helps for me to be like, yeah, it's daytime because, you know, he got the confirmation. But a lot of adults won't say things like that. But the more you're willing to make yourself look a little silly, make mistakes, say things you might not normally say, but are still fairly simple and important, then the quicker your progress is going to be. And that also fits in, I think, with different personality types. For example, you know, I share that Matt, you'll hear his story. He's very outgoing. He describes himself as a performer and he's an actor, you know, so he's just constantly putting himself out there. But that doesn't always work with everybody. Some people just don't feel comfortable doing that. But if you do, I mean, that's that's a great way. And, And also, even if you are willing to do that, you may not be in the type of environment to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That actually really resonates with me because when I was learning Chinese, when I first came to China and I was living in Hangzhou, I would kind of try to play a role. I would be like, you know, I pretend that I was outgoing and I would and I would act like I think an outgoing person would act. And it really worked. Um, I got a lot more practice. But I have a friend named Matt from Australia and uh, Matt's Chinese accent is amazing. And what he told me he used to do was he would approach Chinese kind of like like a comedian doing an impression. Like he tries to mimic every single speech pattern, every little motion and every little twitch or whatever that a native speaker has. His Chinese was really good. In fact, it was so good that it wasn't very standard because he was mimicking his wife's Anhui accent too much. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, the performance aspect, whether it's just a personality thing or whether it's like, you know, the actual way that you talk, the way that you move your mouth, it does really help. So just even repeating what you're saying, just repeating what other people are saying. I mean, that's valuable because if a Chinese person is saying it, the chances are it's probably a standard Mandarin thing to say. Right. But the thing is, I find that when people repeat things, they don't totally try to sound exactly like the other person. 
It's like, I'll repeat what you said, but I'll do it like normal for me. But why not try to repeat it exactly like they say it? Mm. I don't think we usually do that. So you're suggesting that's a better thing to do it like that? Yeah, for the most part, like unless they're yelling at you. (laughs) Or maybe you do want to yell back. That relays into the other thing of, you know, if you're reading something and it's written in standard Mandarin, and if it's dialogue, a script, novel, whatever, the chances are that, you know, what you're reading, especially if it's been published in in print form, it's probably some standard Mandarin that you can actually just straight up repeat. And that gives you more words and more you know, ways to say things and, you know, it may give you sentences that you hadn't thought about how to put it, the Chinese I mean, all together. I mean, you may know the words and you may know all the characters, but, you know, maybe you didn't actually think, oh, this is how a native person would speak. Yeah, it's definitely useful to have like a whole bunch of lines at your disposal that you can just spit out whenever you need them. It doesn't take care of every situation, but it's definitely helpful. It's kind of like a toolkit. Actually, this reminded me of another thing that my son does. Just like every kid, my son, he's four. He sometimes does this game where he just repeats what other people say. And my daughter gets angry, you know, they get in arguments, whatever. But when he does it to me, I I think of it as a a teaching moment. Like, oh, you're going to repeat everything I say? Well, let's repeat some things that are going to be useful but challenging for you. And I use that as like a a pronunciation correction (laughs) session, you know, because I know some things he has trouble saying so that I make him work on those. Uh, It's fun. I think another thing, too, is why we don't necessarily learn like a child is because, you know, people, when you speak to a child, you really do. You you level down your language, especially if it's like, you know, a two-year-old. I mean, you're not going to be talking about the the latest treaty on nuclear disarmament or anything. You're going to speak at something that's practical to that child at their level. And you know if you use big words or you use a complicated idiom or something like that, they're just simply not going to understand you. But as adults... A Chinese person doesn't speak to an American or a non-Chinese speaker like that. It seems like that is an acquired skill, especially when I'm speaking English to a Chinese speaker and maybe their English isn't great. You know not to use complicated words. You know to actually make your conversation, the words, everything you're using much more simple. But you don't always have Chinese speakers who have developed that skill to speak very simply to you as an adult. Right. So what, what you were first talking about, that kind of baby talk, it's called motherese or mother speak. That's been studied by linguists. And there's a very specific way that native speakers talk to their children to facilitate their acquisition of language. For the most part, native speakers don't usually apply that to non-children. A teacher, you know, they do need to repeat, speak slowly, but they shouldn't talk to adult learners the same way they talk to a baby. You know, you can imagine that <laughs> that's not going to go very well. So it is definitely a skill to learn how to take maybe certain aspects of the motherese and adapt it so that foreign adult learners can acquire the language more easily. That's right, because that person who's speaking Chinese to you, they see that you are a grown person. You know, you're not a a little child. And so they visually recognize you as that, even though your language may not be on that same level as a native speaking adult. So it's a little bit of a disconnect there. And coming back to the thing is that people don't speak to you like a child. And that is one reason why you're not going to learn Chinese like a child does. But if they did speak to you like a child, there's a good chance that it would drive you crazy pretty quickly uh, because you're not a child. Okay, so now let's take a little break and have a word from our sponsor. That's right. Today our sponsor is Mandarin Companion. Surprise, surprise. Best damn graded readers out there. That's right. Now we have a lot of people been asking about this lately, and I'm just going to tease it out here. Mandarin Companion, easy to read novels in Chinese, but we are releasing a new level, a new level of graded readers. And this is for everyone who is really struggling to begin reading in Chinese. This new level is going to be written at 150 character level. That is half the level difficulty of our level one readers. Yeah, with level one, I worked really hard to bring down that character count to make it as low as possible, but still be able to tell a story. But, you know, with Manor Companion, we adapted well-known stories. But when you bring the character count all the way down to 150 characters, it makes it a lot easier to read but so much harder to tell a story. So uh, we've been working really hard to make good stories at this 150 character level. Uh, They're just not stories that have been adapted from Western classics this time. However, we do have some great titles coming up. We have The uh, Adventures of Young Sherlock Holmes. Wait, wait, not Young Sherlock Holmes. Boy, Boy Sherlock. Boy Sherlock Holmes. Oops. Because Young Sherlock Holmes is someone else's IP. 
Oh, right. right. Anyway. And one I'm really excited about is My Teacher is from Mars. Stay tuned. That one's actually a pretty good story. I really like that one. Yeah, these are some fun stories despite being at the 150 character level. And they're about four to 5,000 characters long. So you actually got some length in these. But not too much. Not too much. We've been testing them out with some classes and uh, they're being received very well. And we have questions from our listeners. This comes from Anneli, who is from Spain. She writes that I lived in China for two years. She studied some Chinese in Beijing and worked in a Chinese company, but colleagues spoke English, and she didn't really get fluent in Chinese. So she's back in Spain now, uh, but she's saying, I'm looking to find something like a woman's voice talking about her life or Chinese culture topics so that I can get used to Chinese colloquial speaking. It'd be great if you could help with this. Thank you, Anneli. In response to that, Anneli, if you want to listen to some natural Chinese speaking colloquial language, listening to Chinese television shows or Chinese radio may not be the best thing for you if your Chinese is not high enough. One thing we got to come back down to that concept of comprehensible input. If you are understanding less than 90% of what's going on in any conversation, chances are you're going to be clueless about what's really being going on in that conversation. What we do recommend is there are a lot of great Chinese podcasts out there. They're out there teaching you Chinese. They're out there to teach you phrases and conversational Chinese. Some are totally Chinese. Some are a little bit of a mix of Chinese and English. You can also go to YouTube. YouTube is chocked full of all sorts of resources to learn Chinese. You know, when I just go in and search, you know, learn Chinese, there's learn Chinese for beginners, for kids while you sleep, learn Chinese conversation, Chinese alphabet, learn Chinese now, learn Chinese with Emma, whoever she is, learn Chinese characters. I even found a learn Chinese 24-7 with Chinese Class 101 TV. So, you know, if you wake up at 5 a.m. and you want to study Chinese, boom, there you go. All right, but the problem is she's asking for learning Chinese materials, you know, by native speakers that is that is all Chinese. So you're not going to find a lot of that on YouTube. She mentions Himalaya, which is a Chinese word for Himalaya. That is like an all Chinese podcast platform for Chinese, by Chinese. It's for native speakers for the most part. You should be able to find some interesting content in there. It's kind of like Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. There's like a, you know, huge directory of podcasts. And if you look long and hard enough, you should be able to find some material that, you know, is interesting and fairly comprehensible for your level. So I think the takeaway here is when you're going out looking for some of these things, make sure you keep in that concept of listening to something that is a little bit closer to your level. Even if it's a little bit below, that could be okay. But go out there and be careful about listening to that, you know, Chinese news station that's talking about, you know, international politics and Chinese. You know, if you're advanced and you're at that level, great, do it. That's awesome. But if you're not, you may still want to go for something that's a little bit more geared towards learners. Also, we want to hear from you guys. Find us on iTunes. Write us a review. We'd really like to get that feedback from you. Any Every review that is written, it helps other people hear more about and learn more about our podcast. We appreciate it. And if you have a question for us that you'd like for us to answer on air, please email us at feedback at mandarincompanion.com or also go to our website. You can find us there. You can go to our Facebook page. Anywhere you can find us, email us. Let us know if you have a question you'd like for us to address. We want to hear from you. Rants and raves. John, what do you have for us today? You have a rant or a rave? Today, I just want to do a bit of a rant because as you know, I've been working hard on this new level that's below level one. It's a lot of work to choose the characters and the vocabulary appropriately so that you can still tell a story. But I see some other books with the label graded reader on them, which seem to not put a lot of effort into it and still call themselves graded readers. So what I mean is it'll be like 600 character graded reader. And when you look at it, you're like... 600 characters? Like, th there are some really hard words in here. And the problem is it's not like the 600 easiest characters or the, you know, 1,000 easiest words. It's just, oh, here's something we wrote and we counted the characters and we brought the countdown a little bit, but it's not actually appropriate for a lot of learners who can read a good amount of those characters because maybe they can read 550 of the 600 characters, but the other 50 are just totally obscure and not useful at all. So to design a good graded reader, you have to be very careful about choosing useful high frequency vocabulary and not just be like, well, it's not too many characters. So just, you know, you can learn those extra 50 really hard ones on your own. 
Like that's not what a graded reader should be. You don't really a lot of those when it's not just an extra 50 usually. See, that's a slippery slope, right? You're like, oh, we'll just add in a couple characters here. You don't know them before you know it. That book's got like, you know, 100, 200 characters in there. Yeah, and it's true that it is simpler than um, the average article you'll find just by searching online, but it's not a true graded reader. Like a true graded reader works really hard to keep the the vocabulary and for the case of Chinese, the characters at a low level. And then for the words that they know are a little bit harder, then they work hard to repeat those so that you can actually pick them up in context. All right. I have got a rave. Now, this is maybe more of a topic of interest, but it's something I really wanted to talk about. I think it's super cool. So I wanted to rave about it. And this is Chinese typewriters. Yes, I said Chinese typewriters. And no, it's not a typewriter where it's got 3,000 keys on it. A Chinese typewriter, these things were made in the early 1900s. Really complicated things. I'll actually put a link in the show notes for this one. But specifically, there was a professor out of Stanford named Tom Mulaney. He's kind of like this expert on Chinese typewriters. But these things are really interesting. The old original Chinese typewriters, they did not work like you would think, like we're sitting down uh, typing out like words or anything. In fact, in those days, they didn't even use pinyin. It actually has like individual characters that are like, uh, you know, slugs that are set in like, think like a printing press, you know, they have, you actually put like the letters and words together. Well, they have individual characters on these things and you go around, you move this thing, you use the right hand, left hand, move it over the character, hit the button and go, boom. So when you're typing with a Chinese typewriter, it's more of like, dong, dong. you know, and someone who's like uh, typing very fast might be able to type like 80 characters a minute. It's really interesting. Uh, if you guys want to look into this, I thought it was just a really cool thing. It's really scientific, you know, how where they place the characters in. Some of these things you could move out different characters and put different characters in, depending if you're like a lawyer's office, you're using different characters versus like uh, someone who's just writing about government things or whatever. So it's, it was really cool, really, really interesting thing. Uh, there's a like a link in the show notes if you want to learn more about it, some videos showing like how they actually worked. But yeah, so Chinese typewriters, believe it or not, were a real thing. The funny thing about Chinese typewriters is if you were using one of those to write a graded reader, then you would have a, a much smaller set of characters that you would have to type. But to write something that native speaker adults want to read, um, obviously, it takes a lot more characters. You know, it makes me kind of wonder if we inherited some of the limited character set that we have today in Chinese as a result of the Chinese typewriter. I doubt it. Well, do you know? Maybe one of our listeners can, you know, let us know about that. I don't know. All right. If any experts out there on Chinese typewriter, if you're listening, let us know. We want to hear from you. And if you have an extra one lying around, send it to Jared. He wants it. What a great little office this is. I don't you viewers can't see this, but this is cool. That is Matt McGill. We sat down for an interview in our Shanghai office. He moved to China over seven years ago from Scotland. Now I'm from China, it seems. Some might call Matt a Scottish version of Harrison Ford. He's an actor who started out as a carpenter. And today, he and his brother head up the most popular YouTube comedy channel in China called Mama Hoo Hoo. One thing that makes Matt's story unique is that he learned Chinese by himself. Never went to a day of class. Stay tuned. My brother's always been a very film-orientated guy, always had a camera in his hand, so we decided we would start doing videos here. That became a business, and then it also became a, a great hobby, so we started a show called Mama Hoo Hoo, which is becoming more and more popular here in China, especially Shanghai. Well, we describe it as being a kind of a bridge between, between cultures. It's kind of, you laugh at both sides, nobody's ever the victim, everyone gets to laugh at it, Chinese or foreign, and we just try to point out those things that always come up, you know, the classic issues of being a foreigner in China or Chinese meeting foreigners, that kind of thing. Well, I love your videos. We've actually mentioned them a couple times on our on our show here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, Matt, I want to hear a little bit about your story about how you learned Chinese. Even tell us about your story about coming here. How did this all come together with the confluence of where you now are a Chinese speaker? Wow, that's a very interesting, that's an interesting story. My original plan was I was going to go through China, check out China and go to Australia to work there because I was, a, as I said to you before, I was a carpenter and uh, I heard that Australia was paying big bucks for carpentry. So I was on my way there. Hmm. 
landed in China and I, I don't know what happened. I just kind of fell in love with the place. I just, something about it. It just really, it just really caught me. And I just never, ever left after that. Did you speak any Chinese when you came here? Not a word. So my one of my first group of friends here were a bunch of Americans and they were all very fluent in Chinese. We used to go to bars and things like that and trying to talk to any kind of girl and you're trying to use your English or maybe one word of Chinese that you've learned over the years and you just can't you can't get the message across and in swoops your American friend with his fantastic Chinese and this this just really got to me. It got to me at a level that drove me to want to learn how to speak this language. But not enough that I wanted to take classes, strangely enough. So I was in this kind of weird place where I want to know this language. I want to know how do you do this language, but I also don't really, I can't, I can't do the class thing. I, can't, I just, since I was a child, I can't really take knowledge in that way. I, I get very distracted in class. I was always a bit of a class clown, as they call them. I, I, I'm not sure I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was always that guy. And uh, I just, I just couldn't, I can't take knowledge in that way. So I just ended up, what I'd done was essentially was, I kept hearing that similar words constantly used, like ta, tamen, jiga, j, you know, things like that. And I started to ask, like, why, why are these words, why am I, why do I keep hearing them? And so slowly I was taking these little pieces of sentences that I kept hearing, which were very, very arbitrary, very random. Kind of trying to figure out why I kept hearing them so often. And then once you get this kind of what I would like to call like a base structure for how the sentences go in Chinese, which even at that point when I was learning, it wasn't that at all. It was still very English grammar translated to Chinese kind of thing. But once you kind of get this, this kind of structure of how they speak and, you know, where they're putting these words, after that, it just became a kind of a, right, I need to start memorizing nouns, like the names of things instead of being like, what's this and this. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I, it seemed like after about four years, I would say, it was starting to all kind of really gel. I, started, I was starting to notice it. I was starting to get compliments from people, which isn't actually something to go off of. Because, you know, a lot of the time they'll compliment you, even if it's really, really bad. Ni hao. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. wow, I told my ho <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So it was all starting to kind of gel a little bit easier. I was overtaking a few of my friends as well who had been here a little bit longer than me. So I started to think that maybe, maybe there's something in this. Maybe I could get better at this. So I started to kind of just go outside. When I was going outside, I would have a sentence in my head, something new, and I would just try to put it out there, no matter the context. So people probably thought I was insane. You know, we're talking, <laughs> we're talking about, we're in IKEA talking about furniture, and I'm like, "What about the cupcake from the store?" <laughs> <laughs> like trying to put this sentence into reality because it's the one I've learned today. But by doing that, just that one sentence thing a day, I very, very quickly started to get what I call the way I learned Chinese, which is to give the sentence to a Chinese person, watch their reaction, and then let them repeat it back to you because they always will. Mm. You know, they'll be like, oh, you mean to say da 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 da. Mm -hmm. And by doing it, by doing that, that really accelerated my Chinese a lot. Started to just throw sentences at Chinese people and watch them. <laughs> and you're, you're gonna make you tell me, tell me, tell me. So, so you're just kind of repeating words, mm -hmm. and you, I guess, you're preparing sentences in yep. your head, and then practicing those with native Chinese people and seeing what the reaction is. Basically, yeah. So, you, for example, like I want to, I want to. My sentence of the day is, "How do I get somewhere to a certain place?" Then you would just walk up to as many people as you can and ask them. And Chinese people are great at that. They'll they'll look at you blankly for a moment figure out what you're trying to say, and then they'll say, oh, you mean to say da 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 and they'll repeat it to you. That repeating process, for some reason, just sticks in my head every time. Every time I lose my face by not getting it right, <laughs> and they correct me, it really sticks. It really sticks in my head. So that was a really, really strong method for me for the longest time. I would say once once I got to a certain point with Chinese where I was, I was, I was very comfortable in conversation, I just kind of stopped, which wasn't great. But then I started to notice that I was very much plateauing. And I think Chinese for me, I don't know if it's for everybody, but in this kind of wild way of learning, it's very much, it boosts for a while, then it just kind of plateaus for a while, then it boosts for a while, then it plateaus for a while. And then those plateaus is where you start to think, okay, where am I at right now? Where am I at with this Chinese? What is it that I'm missing? What do I, what do I keep hearing still that I'm not repeating or I'm not using? And there's still, I mean, even right now. The strange thing about Chinese is you can hear about 95% of the sentence and still be lost. Mm -hmm. You know, you can still be like, nah, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. I've got 95% of this sentence that I still don't know what it is. Because if the noun's missing or the verb's missing, you get nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you're just, yeah. you're lost. So it's occurred to me more recently, and it's something that I'm trying to do more, is just to ask more. What's the name of this? How would you say this? Or how would you use this verb? Or da, 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 da. 
And I find that that's really helping me a lot more now. It's starting to polish off that, that kind of rougher Chinese that I've had up until now. So it sounds like a really organic process for you. Yeah, it was, there was nothing structured about it. So yeah, I would say organic would be the, would be the word, yeah, definitely. I imagine going out and doing this, it, it required a lot of, I, I guess, courage. There's not a lot of people I think would be willing to go out and make that many mistakes because I think you have to constantly be making mistakes. So what do you think carried you through that? How do you think that was a good fit for your personality? Uh, well, I'm a performer, okay? So the, the compliments helped a lot. When, you, when, you're, when you're talking to people and they're like, what? how did you, you speak in Chinese? That's really, that's, and you're like, yeah, okay, right, this is cool. Like, I like this. I like that people are observing this skill that I'm randomly picking up through no effort of my own at the moment. So that really got to me. You know, the compliment level really, really got to me. I was, this is cool. I'm learning a language. And it's a funny thing because, like, for the longest time, I didn't really think of it as learning a language. I just thought it was this tool that I needed to survive here. But, the, you know, the outcome of that is that you've learned the language. And I never really thought about it like that. I never set out to learn a language. I just had to, I had to survive. Where I was living when I first got here was a small town called Yangzhou, and there was no English there. I still remember to this day coming home from work one night, really, really, really just tired and wanted some food. I went into a Lanjo Lamian. And the reason, just for anyone listening who doesn't know, Lanjo Lamian is very popular for foreigners because the wall's plastered in pictures of the food. So you can literally point at what you want and you can get it. And it's amazingly good. Oh, it's so good. Love that stuff. Oh, it's so great. But the problem was, is I wanted to take it away. And I still remember this to this day, 25 minutes with this woman trying to explain to her <laughs> that I want it you know, making a bowl shape with my hand and then like a bag <laughs> over the top of it with my hand and trying to like, and then I'm going to walk out the door with it. Can you, can you get it? And she's just shaking her head. And I remember getting so frustrated at this lady. I didn't actually say anything to her, but my inner aggression was, you're not getting me. And then, you know, as you, you walk away with the food and you go, you go eat and then you realize, hmm, no, 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 I wasn't getting the message across. It wasn't, she wasn't getting me. This is, this is my fault. I need to get better at this. So dabao was one of the most important words I ever learned in my life was to take away food. <laughs> dabao for you guys, let's see how, take away mm -hmm. uh, was a wrap up, I guess, literally yeah. translated. Yeah, yeah, throw it in a bag. No. <laughs> <laughs> how has your quality of life changed here in Shanghai from beginning not having to be able to speak Chinese, but now being able to have a competency level in Chinese? It's a tricky question because there's, there's big positives and there's also big negatives. Positives being obviously the conversation levels a lot better. You, you, you find that if you're, if you're not speaking the language in China, you're always going to be outside of a glass bowl looking into China. You're never really going to be able to get inside. It. You're never going to be able to really absorb yourself and understand these people or how the whole country works. Same with any country, I would imagine, but China is my only frame of reference for this. Learning the language gets you into that culture. It, gets, it opens up doors to you where you can see things differently. You can understand things more. Literally, you can understand things more. The, the negative side to it is you start to hear you start to hear people's thoughts on you as a as a foreign entity in the street or the worst one for me is elevators a lot of the time I'll get in elevators and people around me just just talking about me just never thinking that I would be able to understand them and it's not always negative but when it is it can be quite quite jarring so that 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 side of it it can be it can be a little bit jarring as i say but i think the positive far outweighs the negative to be fair and also this the fact that put on while like chinese is it's it's a it's a really, really beautiful sounding language when it's used correctly. You know, when it's when it's spoken well, it's 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 stunning. It's a really, really interesting, intricate language. But you very seldom hear that here, do you? You're often hearing these local these local dialects of the language. I don't know if your if your listeners know that, but like even in Shanghai alone, it's separated by I think maybe two or three variations on the Shanghai dialect all very quite unique from each other. Mm -hmm. And the further out you go, each city has its own dialect and it gets, it gets crazier and crazier. An old lady from Shanghai would find it difficult to converse with an old lady from Beijing. I always find that very interesting. For such a large population, the idea that intercity communication was once maybe or maybe still is a bit of an issue. It's, it's, it's an interesting concept. You guys have started this YouTube channel, Mama Hoo Hoo. Well, I got to say, one of my favorite videos is uh, that you're in is the one where you, you got to outfit like a street sweeper. Uh, you're, you're working with some of the street sweepers trying to help them clean up the streets and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh god that was from the prank era that was one of the nicer pranks that was actually that was a real pleasure to do actually and the lady was just so happy to have the help so you're coming in there just speaking chinese or i, I forget what you were saying but you're like you know hey uh, you know I'm, I'm ready to work or yeah, something i think i came in and said uh yeah, I'm, I'm here to help you today and she's like 
who sent you? I said, oh, your boss told me to come down and give you a hand today. It's a really long street or something like that. Let me help you clean it up. <laughs> uh, she was great, actually. And I actually see that woman still around when I go through uh, Jiangsu, Lu, uh, Jiangsu mm -hmm. Road. Down there, I sometimes see her still to this day and stop and give her a little, hello, how's it going? I think, I think she remembers me because she <laughs> talks to me, but I don't really, we never had a conversation about it, but I think she remembers me. That's a good example, I think, of even being able to speak Chinese. Some of the skits you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have Chinese. Yeah, this is very true. My my, my personal all-time favorite one was when I played a, I played a Shanghainese security guard for one of them. It was called the Laowai Bawan. Still to this day, it was my all-time favorite. It was just, it was so great. It was actually a comedian, Drew Fralick, that done this, uh, this, this whole bit on stage, and we saw it and we said we have to make this a video. You're, this is hilarious, and he wasn't too comfortable with the idea because it was a uh, Bao An's uniform on uh -huh. camera online. So, so you guys, for a uh, Bao An is like a security guard at like a gate. So. Should have explained that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a security a gate security guard. So yeah. it's the foreign security guard. Yeah. Yeah. So. He wasn't too comfortable with wearing the uniform, and so I just jumped on it. I said, well, I'll do it. <laughs> Is that okay if I do it? He's like, yeah, sure. So I did it. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was really, really fun. I, I haven't seen that one. So tell us about it. What? So it's basically uh, my friend Andy's a foreigner walking down the street, comes and asks me directions somewhere, and then we just have an interaction and you're in a Baoan outfit? I'm a Baoan. I am. I'm literally a Baoan. You're speaking Chinese or English? Uh, a mix of Chinese and Shanghainese mixed together. <laughs> and the way the script was written was beautiful because it's exactly how these people, these these security guards treat you. You know, it's just so, where are you going today? Why are you going there? Have you eaten today? How are you married? How many kids have you got? How much is your apartment? How much money do you make per month? Wow, that sounds really, really nice. Though. You know, that sounds not bad. And every time he's like, look, where is this street? Can you tell me? And I keep getting distracted and offer him cigarettes and just keep talking to him and keep him going for the longest time. And then in the end, he's like, so where's the street? And I'm like, I don't think that street exists. And that's how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it was so much fun to play. I actually went to, a, I don't know if I should say, but I went to a, another Chinese school to get a little bit of Shanghainese from them, just like how to how to pronounce these words a little bit better. And I went there and the guy just gave me 15 minutes of just telling me that they say it like this because of this reason, they say it like that because of this, and it really helped. Mm. My wife is Shanghainese too, so I was taking what he said and taking it back to her and trying it with her, and she was like, nope, doesn't sound anything like Shanghainese. Nope, <laughs> try again. Nope, nope, nope. But then I do it, I do it on the camera, and a lot of people saw it. They, they recognized that it was there. For the listeners, Shanghainese is a... It's a totally different beast. Yes. Yeah. It uses a whole yeah. different part of your throat. The way the way they talk, it's it's entirely it's ungraspable. In fact, for the for the average guy, so that's why I couldn't do it. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's. I think from what I understand, the tones are even more critical than. In a, yeah, it's it's it's. When I hear them speaking to each other, I just honestly believe in my heart that they don't understand what they're talking about either there's no way you heard that and you took a message from that didn't happen no way fake news <laughs> i could be wrong though an example that i always use for people who are asking about it is i'm from shanghai washu shanghai ren for them is wu si sang henning which is just mm -hmm. wildly different it's a different pronunciation it, they actually use different characters when they're typing as well oh Completely i didn't realize different that. characters i didn't realize that crazy well, tell us, Matt, how did you learn characters? That that was definitely a very, very sneaky, slow process that just kind of came with, it was like a byproduct of learning how to speak. And you can write it in the pinyin, the English letters to spell out the phonetic sound of Chinese. The pinyin. Pinyin, yeah. 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 So I was using this on my phone while talking to people, just writing in pinyin to them. Mm -hmm. And they would reply with Chinese characters. Mm -hmm. I would then take these Chinese characters, put them into another app, translate what they said, and then reply in pinyin. This was the kind of system that I was working with for a really long time. And now thinking about it, I really feel sorry for any Chinese person talking to me at that time. They must have been like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> there was no tones or anything written above it. It was just, you know, Straight English. Straight pinyin, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically English. And just weirdly... You start, it's just the same as when I was when I was listening to Chinese, you just start to see these repeated characters constantly used all the time. Wo, ni, ta, these, these, these just so common words. And then again, it's because you know how to speak it, you start to see the structure laying out in front of you through the through the sentences. And again, the big gaps are the verbs and the nouns, because you don't you're not memorizing them. But you are constantly hearing these these other words in between. So it was just a case of over a long period of time. 
recognizing these repeated patterns in the in the characters and then reproducing them essentially the funny thing about it is is that i can read chinese off of a phone i can type and reply back to them again but i cannot recall the character in my brain like if you ask me right now the character for war maybe what i could do i could i can almost kind of see how it goes like writing it you mean yeah to physically yeah, write right? it yeah. just that recall from your brain to bring the character to the front of your head see it and then draw it out i just can't which is so bizarre that you can read something like that when it's in front of you take it away and you just can't actually that's pretty normal is it that's very normal yeah because learning to handwrite it it's an entirely different skill so, so a lot of learners they they think oh well i should read i should learn to write too but you can become fluent in speaking, fluent in reading, but being fluent in writing is also an entirely different skill. So I wouldn't feel bad. It's just that same type of thing. As sometimes we we can say a word in English, but we're not sure how to spell it. Like oh, maybe, that's a very good way of putting it. Exactly. Like automatopoeia. I, I could probably you know, we'll, we'll try <laughs> Starts it. with an O, right? There we go. <laughs> Ending with an A. We don't that much. I can say it, but I'm not sure how to spell it exactly. <laughs> I'm probably going to get it wrong. You know. That's so, a very good way to put that. Yeah. yeah so I, I wouldn't beat yourself up about that. <laughs> <laughs> My other argument as well is that. We're living in a, a, day, a day and age now where I'm very seldom putting pen to paper anyway in English or Chinese, so typing will do. Yeah. It will do. It'll do for now. I always tell people, I said, learning to type in Chinese, fantastic. Do mm. it. Learning to handwrite in Chinese, well, it's take a lot of work. So Yeah. It's just It just seems like it's the, it's the last piece of the puzzle, though, you know? Like, I've, I've, mm. we've come this far. <laughs> you know, it, just, it would be cool to be able to just kind of jot down. I remember my... My Australian friend Tim, we were in a meeting once and he was looking at the person talking and writing th what they were saying in Chinese without looking at the paper. <laughs> wow. And I was just looking at the paper the whole time. I wasn't even focused <laughs> on what she was saying. I just couldn't believe this guy could do this. But he was, he'd studied here just straight studying Chinese for 10 years. Nothing else, no other distractions. So he was right up there. Like he was all of it. He could do it all. And that always amazes me. That's a pretty high standard, though. Yeah. It really amazes me, though. It is amazing. I mean, even when I see children, Chinese children, writing and using Chinese and interacting with the Chinese language, I still think, just wow, because it's so it's so big. It's just such a huge beast of a thing to try and comprehend. Well, uh, if you see the amount of homework they have to do, I had kids in tiny school, so it's a... Uh, yeah, 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 but it takes a lot to keep that up. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Yeah, I remember when I was learning Chinese, I found back where you're doing QQ days. Perhaps this happened with you, but simply typing out the pinging and seeing the characters come up, you're like, I guess that's it. I'm going to select those. And Absolutely. Yeah. So you're actually letting the technology help you out there a little bit because you write in the pinging, it gives you a selection of maybe a thousand different characters, but it's usually that first to third one that's mm -hmm. going to be the character. And if you just have, if you have enough in your head that you can recall what it kind of looks like, you can select it. Well, tell me about, uh, did you have any breakthrough moments that you can think of where sometimes you were out there trying to use your Chinese and all of a sudden you just had a breakthrough moment or something really clicked in your head? Honestly, every time I'm drunk, <laughs> <laughs> every time, which is not very often, you know, I'm, I'm quite clean these days. Yeah, I, I've always found with, a, I don't know if it's the same in every language across the world. Again, this is my only frame of reference, but as soon as you get a couple of beers, it just, it just all loosens. And I'm not sure to this day whether I'm actually speaking better or I just feel I'm speaking better. <laughs> but it's definitely what you, what you said there, that breakthrough, that like no hold barred anymore you're just speaking trying to get your message across instead of processing in your brain how is the best way to say this you're just letting it flow out so they're big breakthrough moments and i do actually learn things from them i have i've had i've had drunken nights where i've said some things and just been like wow where, where did that come from i'm gonna i'm gonna try and remember that as far as sober breakthrough moments i've had moments where i've surprised myself vocabularies came out of my mouth and i've immediately thought now where the hell did i learn that word you know, just out of nowhere, especially working on film set when you're translating for a foreign director or something like that. And he asks for a specific thing. And just just so weirdly in the moment, it just comes from it just comes from nowhere. You're just actually, yes, I do know how to say that. And then you it, it just comes out. I find that quite unusual. I can't remember any specific words to give you an example, but just words that I would never genu gen generally use. Mm hmm. Just appear just in your brain out. Some, somehow. Maybe you've heard somebody say it in a classroom once or in a different situation. It's just kind of stuck there for some reason. The brain's incredible. Let it me is. tell you, it's an incredible thing, especially with language. What are some of the hardest times you've had in learning Chinese? 
the early days, day to day stuff, just the frustration of, man, I, I know what you just said to me and I have the answer for you. I just can't alliterate it. And you start to feel like I kind of, I don't know where the frustration comes from, though, because you know yourself, you know your capabilities, you know that you're only so good at this language. So you shouldn't be surprised that you can't you can't do this. But I can remember a few times people talking to me and maybe I, I know exactly what he said to me. All I have to do is reply to this and I just I can't get the words out. I can't find the word or I'm saying it wrong. In fact, I, I've got one that trumps that completely, one that beats that completely as uh, taxi drivers. I don't know how long I'm going to have to be in this country before they start understanding me properly. I feel like <laughs> anybody I talk to now understands me in Chinese, but something about taxi drivers, I think, I think their expectation is you don't know Chinese. So their ears are tuned for something, they're, they're, they're tuned for English or they're, they're, they're awaiting something that's not clean Chinese. So you can often see that when you actually do speak to them, one of two things will happen. They'll just kind of shake their hand and be like, uh, don't know, don't know, show me on your phone. Let me see what it, where is it you want to go. Or they will genuinely jump in shock. And they will, <gasps> what? Oh, you, you speak Chinese. Oh, this is, uh, <laughs> this is fantastic. All right, uh, where would you like to go? There's either one of those two reactions, but I've definitely had some frustrated times of just repeating the same words over and over and over to taxi drivers. You know, Wu Wei Lu. Huh? <laughs> Wu Wei Lu. Huh? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do it one more time. Wu Wei Lu. No, and then you show them it, and they're like, "Oh, Wu Wei Lu." I'm like, "Yeah, no, that's that's what I said, mate. <laughs> that's exactly what I said." It's very frustrating. <laughs> uh, well, knowing what you know now, if you could go back and do anything different among your journey of learning Chinese, what would you do differently? I would take a class. I would, in the first day that I got here, I would sit down in a school and I would take a class on just basic sen- sentence structure just how they structure sentences. And I know grammar to anybody, even if it's your own grammar, is quite a daunting thing. But just to have that that little base knowledge there, that little just, hey, look, while you're listening to this, while you're hearing all these random words and trying to piece them together, just know that this is how they're putting them together. Mm. Whether you know the words or not will come, but just learn the structure in which they use them because the automatic reaction is, oh, I've learned these words in, in Chinese now, and then you, you place them out in an English English grammatical sentence, and it really confuses Chinese people. Some of them are very, very quick to be like, ah, I know what you're doing, because maybe they know a little <laughs> bit of English, but it really confuses them. So I would say, I would go back to my, my younger self, and I would say, just sit down, focus for 10 minutes mat in the classroom, and learn some grammar just to know mm-hmm. how to structure it. That's what I would do. Because other than that, I mean, there's only so many sounds in Chinese, and then all you're doing is changing the tones, you know? So once you've kind of learned all these sounds, you just need to know which ones go where and how to how to use the tones for them. But it's that sentence structure that's so alien from English. It's really important that you get that. If you can get that, I think everything else would fall into place quite quickly after that, I think. You feel that that would have boosted your progress? Yeah. Speed th- your progress. I think a lot of my time was wasted just trying to figure out where to put ta and where to put ni and where to put dan shu and and you know how to how to separate the sentence so that was a real big waste of time if i just sat down for an hours an hours class in grammar i probably would have picked that up really really quickly instead i spent two to three years mulling it over in my head but then i mean the upside to that is probably that it's very well ingrained in my head now it's something that i've taught myself so it's something that my teaching method works really well for me because it, you know it's me so it's it's probably quite well ingrained now probably more so than it would have been from a class, but still just to have that have that base. To answer your question, a little grammar class. A little grammar class for you, yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes, I can, I can understand how that would be. If you could give any advice to someone who's learning Chinese right now, what would you, what would you say to them? I would say don't try to, don't, don't try to grasp it all. Don't try to, to cover it all. Figure out what it is you're going to be doing with this language and focus on that because... As a byproduct, you will learn all this other stuff too. Choose something that you're interested in. Choose something that you want to know. Something that you're... So, for instance, if you're into making videos, then focus on video-related Chinese because you'll you'll get really into it. One of the ways that I always remember remembering Chinese is... Uh, a good example is uh, potato. Mm-hmm. Now, their translation is tudo. Uh, Chinese is tudo. The translation of that is mud bean. Mm -hmm. You look at a potato, that's exactly what it is. So it's impossible for me to forget that word now because Mm -hmm. it's such such a great description of what it is you're (laughs) looking at that you kind of forget it. 
So that, that I think that's a really really helpful thing. Yeah, my John, uh, his favorite word is a uh, uh, daishu kangaroo. It's a the bag rat. <laughs> <laughs> bag rat. That's, bag rat. Daishu. <laughs> that's too good. That's that's exactly. That's again. It's such a such a perfect description. There's, and it makes you smile to hear it, like to broken up like that. that there's no way you'll forget it. I won't forget this now. There you go. Next time I see my Aussie friends, I'm going to call them that. The bag rat. <laughs> What's <laughs> up, <a> bag rat? <laughs> How's learning Chinese changed your life? It's made me appear much cooler to my friends back home. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's for real. <laughs> you know, I said my friends back home think that this is just, well, I wouldn't even try to do their impersonation of what they think it is, but they think it's just a bunch of noises all smashed together. They can't believe that this is something that can come out of my mouth, especially since I was, you know, I'm a Scottish guy. I'm speaking very politely right now, but to them, to go from Scottish to, to learning Chinese is, well, it's it's wonderful in their eyes. Even though I'm just going home and saying things like, Jiang Su Lu. And they're like, whoa, wow, you're Chinese, man, that's amazing. All you're doing is naming a street, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be very good to appear to be good. In a general sense, it's it's made me, uh, it's given me more work options for a start. A lot of my a lot of my work now is uh, on set translations, doing translations for different kinds of uh, foreigner film companies that are here, directors and things like that. So it's opened up a whole world there for me. Also, the acting side of it, I can do Chinese acting as well, which is again lots of fun. As we said, and as I was saying to you before, this weird thing about memorizing Chinese scripts, it seems to me to be far easier than memorizing an English script. And I think purely the reason is is because the value and experience that you attach to English, you know how it should sound, you know exactly what you're going for, what the script wants, what the emotion should be. Whereas with Chinese, it's it's a large grouping of sounds that you have to get out of your mouth and, and get across to the other person. The depth of meaning and understanding of it isn't there like it is with English or anybody's native language. So for me to memorize and regurgitate that is a lot easier than to memorize the feeling and why am I saying this in English and what's the reason that I want to say this? Apart from work, actually there's, there's, there's lots of different reasons why you would learn it though, but I think most of them are very much work motivated with Chinese. It's mm -hmm. such a complicated language that if you're going to sit down and learn this language, it seems to me like you've got to have some kind of goal with it. I feel like people learn French and Spanish and things like that because it sounds beautiful and it's a nice hobby to learn something like that and you can you can read it as an English speaker. But to sit down and learn Chinese, it always seems to me that anyone who I know who's really going at it and studying it is for one of two reasons. They either really love Asian culture or Chinese culture and they want to get in about it or for work. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, work has really, really helped me with this and just general general day-to-day -day in China. And speaking and understanding when my wife is angry with me, because she only uses Chinese <laughs> when she's angry. <laughs> we have an angry Chinese woman yelling at you. That's that's a whole new experience. <laughs> yeah. And Shanghainese as well. So that little bit extra attitude in there as well, which is real nice. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, dungeon master, analysts, consultant, Lego master builder, railroad conductor, and that one guy named Eddie. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to Mark Zuckerberg, we ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself. Yep, just me, Jared Turner. And I'd like to thank Matt McGill and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Passon. See you next time.